Okay, good morning, everyone. We might get underway. Um, we've still got people joining us, um, but we'll make a start because it's gone 12.30. Um, so thank you all for joining us for our Managing African Lovegrass webinar. I'm Sarah Baker, the Pasture Development Officer uh, for New South Wales BPI based in Tamworth, and I'm going to be your host for today. Um, just firstly, to get started, I'd like to do a quick acknowledgement to country. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we live, work and work and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so we might get underway with our presentations. Our first presenter this afternoon is Dr. Henwen Wu. Um, Henwen is a senior, oh, sorry, a principal research scientist with the DPI Weeds Unit based in Wagga. He has over 20 years of experience in weed research and management. And today he's gonna to be talking to us um, about his experience with African lovegrass. So Henwin, I'm gonna hand over to you um, to start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hope, um... oh, good. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for coming to the to the webinar. And uh, first, I actually was quite surprised, but certainly you're pleased to know so many people signed up for this webinar, and not only from New South Wales, but also from other states, um, which really demonstrate the uh, the urgencies of a coordinated approach for managing invasive grasses like African lovegrass. So in my talk today, I basically have uh, two main, main areas. First up, I'd, go, I'd like to give you a brief, um, uh, in, brief overview of history and also a little bit biology explaining why African lovegrass is so invasive and followed by my recent um, research on uh, African lovegrass, mostly in Kuma area. Um, the history um, is native to um, certainly to uh, Africa and has been extendedly uh, introduced to Australia before 1900. And after that, there have been more than um, hundreds of introductions from different parts of the world. And uh, with the, after that, the very first herbarium record actually was collected in New South Wales in 1900. And now the African lacras, as you can see from the map, actually covering all Australian states. And because of the multiple introductions from different parts of the world, so let's contribute a lot to the great diversity of African lacras we have here. So mostly we have at least more than seven different economic types. And identification of these types is very difficult because all these types, they have overlapping morphological features. It's very difficult to differentiate them. And the, um, as we all know, it's a, it's a perennial and it's a C4, warm season grass. So that means it's highly likely, it's highly adaptable to a broad range of different uh, climatic conditions. And also highly suited to, um, especially suited to uh, low fertile, light and sandy soils rather than heavy clay soils. And now, Lisa, I'm just going to give you a few of the Lisa key biological features why explaining why African lovegrass is so invasive. There are so many features, I only choose a few. So number one is a huge amount of seed production. As you can see, each pentacles or seed head can produce 300 to 1,000 seeds. As you can imagine, one single plant, it's a big tussock, you have so many dealers, so the seed production per plant or per tussock is going to be messy. And there's a research show actually showed that in the heavy infestation of uh, African lovegrass, 
it could potentially produce 600 kilos per hectare. And these seeds, because are light and small, as you can see in the, in the, in the presentation, so one grain of seeds is roughly about 5,000 seeds. And these seeds have a short dormancy. You will get 50% uh, germination with, uh, within two weeks and um, almost to more than 90% germination after one month. And uh, the, uh, a lot of people are concerned about the seed longevity. However, at the moment, there's a no consensus about the longevity. Some people say the short, medium from one to five years, but some people say our documents say the more than 15 years. So this is a certainly an area need to be the further study to confirm this. And let's see, because the light is small and certainly have a multiple uh, dis dispersal mechanisms. So it can be from wind, water, human, animals, machineries, a lot. So all these uh, means uh, really lays uh, highlighting the importance of, of uh, sea set control. Otherwise, uh, otherwise the, uh, uh, there's a risk of uh, establishing a huge uh, areas of uh, African lapgrass in the new invaded areas. So let's a bit, uh, I think that's enough about the uh, manage uh, about the biology introduction. And I just want to touch a few small slides with uh, general general management. As we all know that uh, prevention is the king for managing so many uh, invasive species. However, I, I just want to touch base about the animal spread. So um, I'm, I was really scared, scared when I read the document about 47% of seeds remain, remain viable after passing through cattle. So in this case, if we are suspecting animals grazing mature African lovegrass, and uh, so we should be thinking about a restricted stop movement, at least to those uh, non-infected areas. Or alternatively, we have to control the grazing timing. At least we should not graze the, uh, the African lovegrass after the sea have formed. And there have been uh, a lot of research in the past in terms of non-chemical control options and chemical control options. So I'm not really uh, listing a whole lot of all the non-chemical control options. I just wanted to highlight uh, the gr rotational grazing and fertilizers and the pasture competitions has been uh, highlighted in the past. And all these uh, non-chemical options are certainly a provider different levels of control, different on, depending on different situations. And also for chemical control, they basically only uh, relied on two key chemicals, which are through propanate and glyphosate over the last at least uh, two decades. So as the result, there are already some biotypes of African lapgrass involved resistant to um, through propanate. However, resistant to um, collapse is still currently unknown. We will have here more um, details on the fluoropropanate resistance from Joe, um, our next speaker. And another issue I want to mention is the background we created after herbicide application. As you can see from the photo, you, yes, you wipe out the, um, the grasses, but all the rubbish come up, what do we do? We still have to find a way to control these, uh, the unwanted grass, unwanted uh, weed species. And can we think about how, maybe we can think about how to introduce uh, desirable native or pasture species. And if we do, then what would be the suitable species for the local area? And we certainly have to think about um, 
the species tolerance to uh, flu propanate. And this is uh, the table I came up from by reading from different uh, papers. Um, you're not going to have time to go through all these details, but in, in the summary, the uh, wallaby grass, microlina, and subclovers are typically uh, highly sensitive to um, flu propanate. And all other grasses, native grasses, and introduced grasses, they have a uh, relative relatively tolerant, but depending on the rate you use. And now basically I want to share with you the research we had in Kuma from last year. So we basically looking at those four key areas, competition, pre-emerging herbicides, post-emerging herbicide, and spray topping. So past the competition, we, uh, we saw a bit late according to the region. We saw it on the 20th of April. So we have uh, different crops, wheat, canola, and mixture of uh, chicory and lucerne, and came with uh, the respective pre-emerging herbicide. The main exercise was going to see uh, if these uh, crop competition can provide suppression on African love grass. So that's about uh, later on the end of November, about the seven months after the sowing. So there are two key points I want to highlight here. So um, when, we do, when we're doing assessment, we did see the old perennial plant, but the old perennial plant actually was suppressed. That's one thing. And also we're trying to look for the new emerging seedlings, which we can't because the crop condition competition provided very good suppression on the seeding emergence. So the crop or partial competition have two functions. One is suppressed on the old plant regrow and also suppressed on the new seeding emergence. And uh, this is uh, two months after we harvest or slash the crops. And uh, as you can see, um, those are uh, either winter crops or winter canola or wheat. After the harvest and the old plants start to regrow. However, their growth stage is way behind the uh, new crop control that's on the right hand side of the picture. So at this stage, the new control one, you already have seed head formed, mature seeds, but the other two plots still not yet. And this is the best picture I want to show you is the, um, it's the, the mixture. And certainly this uh, mixture provides a long-term suppression from winter all the way to, through to summer. Now um, I move on to uh, residual herbicide. So we have uh, two sites in Tuma evaluating about uh, 20 different treatments. And as you can see from the picture, because uh, it's so thick of the old plant, so we have to um, mow it. And uh, in order to have a bit more improved the coverage and the herbicide was a uh, applied in early spring. And basically the picture show you the, um, the overall view of the field site. So I want you to highlight a few key points here. So when we look at mature plants, old plants, so a lot of trees at this time, they didn't have any significant impact. Now we move on to the seedling suppression. So actually a lot of these uh, residual herbicides are, are doing a great job in suppressing the seedlings. So in here, we are separating the old plant and seedlings. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I can't really, I'm not allowed to give you all the chemical details because just the uh, layer registration status. Um, so uh, when we go to, um, and a lot, a lot of these uh, residual herbicides are actually a commonly used herbicide in uh, winter cropping. And they are relatively short term residuals as compared to a uh, full propanate. So they, they hopefully they provide a, a greater options for at least for croppers for a bit more choice in terms of residual herbicide. And um, these are the over, over visual rating of the control as you imagine through propanate doing a good job. However, I just want to highlight the second one with uh, Group G, that's uh, about a 50% control. This herbicide was actually quite um, intriguing. So this was the initial um, suppression. And as, as mentioned, that one they provide a good, good suppression on the, um, the C emergence. We couldn't find anything in between the gaps. And this is the seedings. Um, in the untreated control plot. So we will have mature plants and seedlings. So this is a particular treatment which achieve a 50% control. It's a type of imi herbicide. So when we did the initial um, assessment, we took on the 23rd of November, about uh, 80 days after the herbicide application. And regrowth when we went there, 140 days. So when we first um, assessed, um, they, they look like uh, the, the plant looks so much greener and softer as compared to the untreated control. And we did a fee value testing, and certainly this a greener, softer looking, uh, provide uh, better values as compared to the. Uh, untreated control mature plant. So I, basically I want to highlight these two type of plants. So after this seminar, this is, this is basically applied to all the perennial weeds. So we have two targets. One is a, the old plant and one is a newly emerging seedling. If we are only targeted one, that means we are not going to achieve much. And now going to the post-emergent herbicide. Again, we have two sites, uh, different treatment put it in. Again, we have to slash to improve the coverage. And here we use in a double lockdown approach. We have first knock 23rd of November, followed by 10 days later with, with a second knock. And this is a result that I'm going to show you. So basically, uh, the, the treatment without the second knock, this is single applications, there are only six treatments showing good result. Normal, you, you imagine glyphosate and fluopropanate. However, in this treatment, we did identify two new mixtures that uh, the fourth mix with glyphosate and fourth with, um, or dims with glyphosate. And if we continue to look at these two uh, treatments, and this is the, the double knock with different herbicides, and it's an uh, initial application of all these, followed by either these three different herbicides 10 days later as a second knock. So all these are second knocks provide very good, improve the control of the first application. And these numbers are very similar to the, uh, to the prominent uh, fluopropanate based uh, treatment. And now we're going to the um, uh, spray topping. We basically only choose you know, six different herbicides. We reckon might provide a bit of C set control. So we are putting onto the African lacra the sea head just imagine 
emerging, just you see, can you can see the, the dark sea head coming out. So the result actually showing the glyphosate at lower rate, been doing a very good job, achieving 95, at least 95% of control on the sea set. And followed by the glufosinate and the other two uh, paracop based uh, treatments. And this is the, the glyphosate impact on the um, C set. As you can see from the right hand side, hardly to see any mature C form as compared to the untreated control on the left. Um, those are the current research we have in Kuma, but there are many other research already in that area as well, and also nationwide. I just want to briefly go through that. There's a Sydney Uni student uh, study, a PhD study on African lovegrass, and also there are a couple of projects on remote detection and mapping using aerial area drones and also using satellite imageries and uh, also robotic and camera we detection. And they are also, um, New South Wales uh, initiated a biological control program through the nomination process. And the uh, progress has been made, a lot of research has been made, initially made in South Africa. And um, so far, as far as I'm aware, there'll be three potential biological agent target be identified and nomination going to submit to the federal government by end of this year. And at the moment, I'm actually working on the proposal submit to KISS, Center for Invasive Species Solutions. As we can say, we probably need a national coordinated approach to work on these invasive grasses like um, serrated tussock, chili and needle grass and African lab grass. So we need a lot of growers participation. So if you are interested, interested in, to be part of the programs, please uh, talk to us. And uh, the last one, not the least, um, Jo Powell is going to show you her result of uh, herbicide resistance pretty soon. And uh, finally, I certainly I'd like, like to thank a lot of helpers uh, for the project and the funding support from the KISS and DPI. And uh, my contact there, feel free to email me any questions and concerns and inquiries, and we certainly would like to have you on board. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Hanwen. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come through. Um, yes, just finding them here. Um, this one was probably more of a comment, uh, but you might like to add to it. Herbicide control with roller wiper prevents loss of non-target species and reduces their ground. Um, roller wiping post-grazing, um, so, des so desirable species um, have been grazed low. Have you done any work with uh, roller wiping? No, no, not yet. Um, certainly it has been practiced, especially I think in the bigger area and uh, has been doing a good result, but sometimes can be variable. Um, yeah, depend on the, on the height, height of the African target weeds to your native grasses. If you can see the differential in height, it will be difficult to impose. And, but you, if you can, I think there'll be very good um, options at least you can selectively control the African lovegrass. Even though sometimes you might not be able to control to kill the African lovegrass, mature African lovegrass, but uh, as I showed before, you might be able to stop the sea set. Cool, okay. There's a question about how long before flupropanate resistance is seen. We might just hold that question because Jo is gonna cover that in her presentation, um, or I'm pretty sure she will. Uh, what else are we up to? Yeah. Has, has any work um, been done with con cropping control? So I think you mentioned you, you some of your treatments were wheat and canola um, in your experiment. 
Um, do oh, you have any control? Yeah. Um, yeah, in uh, in that cropping situation, of course, you have uh, normally um, in a cropping situation, you have a pre-sowing knockdown, which we did using collapse to remove all the rubbishes. Hopefully, we can set back a little bit up on the mature African lab grass as well. And then in a cropping situation, you always come with a pre-emerging herbicide to go with the cropping. And as I demonstrate in the residual herbicide treatment, a lot of these uh, pre-emerging herbicides used in the crops, winter crops, actually they did a very good job on suppressing the, um, the new emergence, even though they, they had a little impact on the mature perennial old plant. Yeah, cool. Thank you. All right. Um, lots of questions coming in. Uh, we might do one last question and then we'll have um, hopefully some time at the end of the webinar for further questions. Um, so this question, in a mixed grasslands, how best do we distinguish African love grass from other grass seedlings? That is a very good one and very challenging one. But yeah, that's why I got, I'm thinking about the, um, yeah, it's very difficult, I can tell. And uh, even because uh, I just started working on this African love grass last year, and, I, and when I first saw seedlings, it puzzled me a lot. So I had to go through great details of leaves, or oracles and owns, all that, to separate um, African luck grass from, um, from the uh, natives. So I think uh, we probably need, uh, that's why I probably need uh, a lot of awareness or, or ID campaign, at least uh, through those areas which haven't been inundated with African lab grass. For those uh, saturated areas, the ID possibly not going to be a big issue. Okay, thank you very much, Henwen. Uh, we might move on to our second presenter. So Henwen, I'll get you to stop screen sharing um, and we'll get Jo to start sharing her screen um, yep. while I do a bit of an introduction. So our second presenter is Jo Powell. She's a senior agricultural advisor with local land services, um, Southeast Local Land Services, I should say, and she's based on the Monero. Since joining New South Wales Agriculture back in 2004, she's undertaken both research and advisory work with land managers across Southern and Central New South Wales. She has a postgraduate qualification in sustainable agriculture and has recently completed a Master's of Natural Resource Management. Her agricultural interest, interests are in pastoral legume production, constraints, um, herbicide resistance, which we'll be talking about today, and resilience in pasture systems and new invasive plant species. So Joe, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, is that coming through okay? Yes, it is, thank you, it's working well. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone and um, thanks to Sarah and Helen for inviting us to be part of this presentation today. Um, I've been asked to just give everyone a bit of an update on some of the herbicide resistance work we've been doing um, looking at our perennial grass weeds down here on the Monero. It's been going for quite a few years now um, but aware that some of our two participants today are not from this local region or even within the state so I guess just to give you the first glimpse about where we are um, we're in the southern part of, of New South Wales, sitting just below the ACT. So we are bordered by Nomadji National Park up in the northern end, Kosciuszko up in the mountains, um, the Victorian border down south, and uh, the extension of the Wadbilliga National Park up on the eastern escarpment. So it's a fairly large open area. It is classified as southern tablelands, um, but we do have a slightly different environment um, to the northern section of our southern tablelands. Quite drought prone at times, but you would certainly not know it this year at all. <laughs> um, so look, it's it's a perennial problem for us. Um, we have perennial grass weeds, primarily serrated tussock and African love grass, that we are trying to deal with. Um, and for us, we've been dealing with them for 40, 50 years. So this is nothing new for us. Um, they are still spreading, um, becoming more invasive over time, and as we are now finding becoming harder to manage. So look, this herbicide resistance work started um, originally back looking at serrated tussock um, and it sort of came about from about 2016 onwards. We'd had quite a wet season 
And we were starting to get comments from land managers along these lines that, you know, I sprayed that paddock and it should have died. Or, you know, I sprayed it, it started dying. And then we started seeing things come back. Um, and that then triggered a whole lot of investigation looking at the climatic conditions when they were sprayed, what chemicals were used, at what rates, under what conditions. And we came to the conclusion that it, you know, it was definitely looking like we may have some resistance issues, but we wanted to know for sure and that testing was hence warranted. Uh, so working with the local Snowy Monero um, Regional Council biosecurity staff, we basically developed a, um, a list of potential sites for sampling, which were ones that had long histories of fluoropropanate use. And we've got uh, properties down in this district that has been, have been using fluoropropanate since the late 70s, early 80s. So long period of time for potential use. Uh, and also we just got reports from landholders or from other staff on the ground who said that they had recognised a spray failure and wanted to investigate it further. So with the serrated tussock work, let's see if I can get this screen to roll. Oh, well, in summary, the crux of it was we found herbicide resistant serrated tussock. <laughs> um, but the process that we went through, um, and this applies to serrated tussock and African love grass, so I just wanted to take people through the process um, of how the testing is actually done. And basically, we collect mature seed um, from the plants in the field. Um, so we're looking for not freshly pushed out seed heads, um, but ones that have been there for a while where the, the seed in the panicle has actually matured. So we collect that seed about an A4 envelope full. Um, and in our instance, we sent them across to the plant science consulting lab in uh, Adelaide. The plant science consulting crew then germinate the seed that we provide to them. Um, and you can see that in that, that top picture there, that's a whole heap of African lovegrass seedlings um, that came from the seed we sent through. They grow those seedlings out and then eventually transplant them into um, pots that you can see down below to allow those plants to start growing out. The important thing to note there that this testing is done under non-limiting conditions. So the plants get plenty of light, um, water, the temperature is a good, good growth temperature for them. So the only thing that should be stressing these plants out is the herbicide when we apply it. So basically, um, we chose three rates of fluoropropanate application to test on the serrated tussock, and we used the same rates with African lovegrass, and that was 1.25 litres, 2 litres and 3 litres per hectare without wetter, um, just to see if there was a rate response um, with the seedlings and the plants. Uh, at the end of the day, what we found out was basically how many plants survived and how the plants responded to the herbicide treatment that they received. All right, so over two years of serrated tussock um, testing, we had almost 60 samples um, processed, majority from the Monero, but others stretched up into the other parts of the Southern Tablelands. Um, and you know, the good news was that we, we still found sites with very susceptible to fluoropropanate. Um, 15 sites were identified as having a certain degree of resistance developing, and 28 showed what we thought was fairly strong resistance um, to the herbicide which was quite concerning. Um, again, given the long history of the use in this district, we wanted to like, look further afield as to what was going on. Um, and these sort of results had also been found in, in Victoria and Armidale um, and since in the southern central tablelands as well. And I guess that led us to the next question, which was, what about African lovegrass? And we needed to move further on that one. So this is, essentially sometimes what we're faced with here on the Monero. Um, large, thick swarms of African lovegrass um, through a landscape that can be quite drought prone at times, rather challenging, has a lot of native species in it at times, and the lovegrass hides quite well within it. And that is part of the challenge. Um, I think one of the questions before was, how do you distinguish the difference? Um, a lot of time spent walking through paddocks, getting familiar with the plant. You can see there that the plant there is higher than my dog. Um, and is growing quite happily in amongst you know, native perennial grasses that we also are trying to preserve whilst getting rid of African love grass. So it's a massive challenge. So in the first year, we did a pilot test just to make sure we could actually get viable seed and the process worked well. Um, so we only collected a small number of, number of seed samples from sites in a couple of areas of the Monero. Um, again, sent those through to Plant Science Consulting and um, and the results you can see there, we had five samples come back as resistant, three with developing and four as susceptible. Um, and you can see the picture on the left there. It's an example of um, the different rates. The, the plant on the left-hand side is the control, so there's no treatment. 
Uh, the next one across is 1.25 litres, next one across is two litres, and the next one across is three litres per hectare of flupropanate. So that's a good response there, showing that you've got an uncontreated plant and any rates um, really stressed out and eventually killed those plants. The picture on the right shows you an example of a susceptible, sorry, a resistant population. And you've got a plant that's untreated, again on the left, and then 1.25, two litres and three litres. And you can see that the three litres per hectare, the plant's even gone ahead into reproduction again. So it's, it's not showing any slowing down of its growth um, when you throw three litres per hectare at it. And that was a quite a concerning response. So given those outcomes, we wanted to scale up that project and actually get better coverage across our district. So we did uh, over 35 samples um, across the Monero district in 2021. And that was through a collaborative project, which was funded by local land services, working with Monero Farming Systems, our farmer group down here, and with funding from the Boko Rock um, Community Fund. And these are the results um, that we managed to get from the seed that we could collect that was viable. Um, obviously at the 1.25 litre rate, uh, you're really not throwing a huge challenge at some of these plants. Um, and we came up with a very high level of resistance at the 1.25 litre rate. Upping the rate to two litres per hectare, um, you know, there were still certainly plenty of sites where we had really good control at that lower rate, um, but we were still picking up sites where that two litres per hectare rate didn't make a good enough impact. And then at the three litres per hectare, um, you know, we we're finding more sites that were susceptible to that higher rate, which is what we wanted to see. Um, but unfortunately, we're also seeing what's a little concerning, which is this tail end of medium and high resistance. And in these circumstances, you're looking at a survival rate of between 50 and 100% of the plants after you've thrown three litres per hectare at them. Now, that's not a good outcome from a spraying perspective. You know, half to 100% of plants you're spraying aren't dying. Uh, again, another glimpse as to what this actually presents like in the testing process. Um, here we've got some strong resistance. Um, again, untreated control on the left and the different rates scaling across from left to right. Um, this is really not slowing down this, this resistant population. And then a susceptible population, again, looks incredibly stunted and then continues on to die. So we're seeing these stark contrasts in these plant populations. So what does this really mean for us at the end of the day? It can be quite alarming to get these herbicide resistance findings. Um, but what we're saying is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, flupropanate is still a really important herbicide um, that we rely on to control our perennial grass weeds. Um, and that hasn't changed. We now just need to be a bit more aware of what's going on and start accepting that resistance is part of our farming systems now and we have to manage it. Um, so if you do choose to use flupropanate, keep a close eye on it. We want to preserve it for as long as we possibly can. Um, if you're getting plants that are surviving, chip them out, treat them with glyphosate. Um, if you do have resistance concerns, investigate testing if you can. I'm going to really hit on this one again. You know, we need to start looking at that integrated approach. Um, Hanwen touched on it before. You know, what are the other approaches we've got? Now, obviously, chemical control. Um, but we've got all these other options like physical control, managing and manipulating soil fertility. The pasture and grazing management one is complex, but really important and Hamwin's work will help feed into that process for us. And also managing our farm biosecurity. So how are we spreading the weed ourselves across our properties, between properties and around our district? Um, can we start reining some of that, that process in? And the crux of it at the end of the day is we've got to start using multiple tools to try and pull this together. Um, because otherwise we're banging the head up against the wall. If we're not changing what we're doing, we're not going to get anywhere. So if you do want to really rely on herbicides, and often we have to with these big infestations, um, the recommendation is always to generally try and use shorter acting or short residual herbicides. Um, but flupropanate gives us this option for a longer period of residual activity. Um, so we're saying, look, use these wisely. Um, don't reapply consistently on the same parcel of land year in and year out. And the label does recommend that for us as well. My biggest bugbear is please keep good records. There's nothing worse than going in to try and do an investigation on a spray failure and finding no records. Um, and, and the label is there for good guidance. Um, we also have the off-label permit to give us extra, extra direction as well. And ideally we are looking to rotate herbicides. Now this is a lot easier in the cropping sector because we have a lot more herbicide tools up sleeve. 
um, with perennial grasses, it is limited, but it is still important to keep that mode of action rotation happening. And at the end of the day, if you suspect resistance, get tested. And I think that claim's pretty easy to follow these days after the last couple of years. So where do we go from here? Um, obviously, the head in the sand approach can't continue. Um, Central Tablelands, New South Wales, we've now got confirmed uh, resistance in serrated tussock. Uh, and the New South Wales DPI is looking to investigate um, chili and needlegrass, serrated tussock and lovegrass resistance across other areas of um, New South Wales as well. So I think the more we look, the more we will find it and we'll just have to manage it as the cancer comes up. The herbicide control options is a really big one. Um, the work for serrated tussock was done many years ago um, by some of the Victorian crew and uh, Tony Cook and co at DPI. We came up with other options, but with limited applicability. Um, and the work that Hanwin's doing right now on African love grass will hopefully help fill in some of that information to give us other options or combination options that we can use if we start using flupropanate. Um, but you can see the results from his site. You know, it's still working really well in a lot of situations. Flupropanate shortage, um, it has to be mentioned, very limited availability at the moment and likely to be for some time. Um, again, that's out of our control and we need to wait for the commercial factors to get back into play and supply to free up again. Um, but that could take some time and we have to manage that in the, mean, in the meanwhile. More locally, um, Jed Brown, University of Sydney is doing some really interesting work following on from the identification of resistance to see if the resistant plants are more vigorous or less vigorous um, in their behaviour and growth compared to susceptible populations. And that'll give us a glimpse as to how we need to manage these plants, whether we can and to treat them the same or whether they need a different type of management. Uh, and locally with the local land services, we're looking to actually investigate some of the possibilities of glyphosate resistance or even cross resistance. So we'll be partnering with Land Science Consulting in the next 12 months to undertake that work. So we've got a fair bit to go um, to keep answering some of these questions that keep coming up. And finally, we've worked with a lot of people to get this project off the ground and running. Um, obviously, all the work and testing has been done are done by Plant Science Consulting, um, but a big shout out to Monero Farming Systems and all the land managers from across the districts who have um, helped us identify sites and helped us collect the seed and, and get this project off the ground. So, thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, that was a very informative presentation. Um, Joe's also got a put together a fact sheet. Um, so I'll pop a link to that into the chat um, with a bit more information on herbicide resistance in perennial grasses. Um, and we'll also send that through in a follow-up email with the webinar recording as well. Um, so a few questions have come through for you, Jo. Um, we might start off with, um, yep, yeah, so, the first one's around spot spraying. Just wondering how you applied the per hectare rate in a spot spray scenario um, in your testing. Yeah, so you just break it down to the knapsack rate at the end of the day, um, which is a very simple conversion, thankfully. So for reporting purposes, we just scale it up to the per hectare rate. Um, but yeah, it's, you just break it down to the knapsack rate. So that per 10 litres, um, or if you're in bigger tanks, per 100 litres. So. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, there's been a couple of questions come in around, can you comp combine flupropanate and glyphosate? Um, and what's the best practice for doing that? Yeah, uh, look, it is a, quite a common practice, um, particularly heading out of winter um, into that seeding reproduction phase to try and rein in some of that seed production. Um, it, it's a process that clearly works um, and, and Hamlin's work also helped demonstrate that as well. Um, the only, I guess, challenge with that is that if you are starting to see any sort of resistance, it's very hard to distinguish what herbicide is possibly causing that um, resistance or that slow death um, if it happens. And we need to, I guess, acknowledge that the, the chemicals do work very differently in the plant. Um, one requires active growth in the plant to take up the flupropanate, um, and the other one's designed to stress the plant um, and shut it down. So. They can be a little counterintuitive, um, but if they're applied together properly um, at the right time of year, we can get very good results. So, um, yeah, um, Sarah, can I just um, keep in here? Yeah, yeah from that uh, post immersion trial, we have um, through propanate alone and also mixed with glyphosate. 
and results clearly show um, mixing with glyphosate really did a outstanding job. And in this case, it doesn't seem to be need a, a second knock. However, if you have a low, if only a lone treatment with um, fluvopinate, even though at a higher rate of three meters, you probably still require a second knock. Thank and you. even herbicide alone, or even glyphosate alone, is not uh, even give you the ninety percent control. Depend on different growth stages. Cool. Thank you. Um, a question has come through. Uh, is there some way you can send um, samples, and I'm going to assume that it's African lovegrass samples or serrated tustic, off for testing for resistance? Absolutely. Um, there's two main providers. Um, we've got John Broster over at um, CSU at Wagga um, and Plant Science Consulting with Peter Basalis um, over in South Australia. So they're, they're, this is what these guys do for a living um, and they do a very good job. So it's quite a simple process and just contact them for the information about testing. So we might and put a link to um, contact those people in the email we'll send out with the webinar recording. And also just um, keep in mind, um, we were developing a proposal. So let the uh, herbicide resistance survey, even random or target, is uh, one of the key components. So if uh, any growers or local control authorities suspecting of uh, any um, resistance, yeah, well, feel free to email us anyway. Thank you. Thank you. I'll look. The questions keep coming in. Thank you for those that are sending in their questions. Um, I'll just go next question. We might um, go back to Henwen. In your trial, are you looking at the seed bank changes, um, I'm assuming African lovegrass seed bank, in your various treatments? No, um, uh, we haven't we haven't done so, but we'll be. Uh, it's only one year so far, so seed bank monitoring uh, certainly will need uh, multiple years. So we'll be um, checking the emergence coming out from next year. So, but even though it's only one year startup, it's going to uh, to be difficult to get a conclusive conclusive um, results. So actually, I actually have in mind, um, this is a seed bank data certainly need to be um, properly studied. So we are thinking about could be could be done through a proper burial studies over at least a uh, five years period. And then in that case, we can uh, accurately, accurately quantify what sort of percentage seed survive after one year, after two years, after four years, and after five years. Um, we have a question here. It comes from Queensland. Um, are there Australian native love grasses that are similar to African love grass? I think the answer to that's going to be yes. Um, there are a number of similar native species. Yep. Um, there's a second part to the question. Is African love grass the only invasive love grass species? In southern Queensland, there seems to be some debate as to which species is rapidly appearing along our roadsides. Yeah, I think there are quite a few similar looking species, of course. That's a question is yes. And um, I think there was there was one in southern Queensland, I think it's quite almost many areas. But uh, I think it's called sting lovegrass. Yeah, I think it's uh, happening in southern New South as well. So. Yeah, um, but uh, African lovegrass certainly have a greater coverage as compared to other the species. So it depends on local areas concern, of course. They might have a different control target. Yeah. Some of the other lovegrasses do have some reasonable grazing value too. We, we see a few down here, particularly over a wet summer. Um, and you know, they, they can provide some reasonable feed um, when they do grow. So. Well, not, not all love grasses are bad. Um, and I guess with getting the right identification is tricky at times. Um, and then within African love grass, as Hamlin showed, we've got all these different biotypes. So you could have African love grass, but it could look very different than five, 10 kilometers down the road, which is also love grass. Thank you for that. Um, 
got a question here about burning. What effect does burning have on existing plants and seeds in the um, Burning can be fraught with danger. Um, as many of us found out during the, um, the recent bushfires, you know, it's, it's an activity you've got to undertake very carefully. And I, I always emphasize that up front. Um, love grass can get away very quickly when it's ignited. Um, what we found with, and with the Department of Primary Industries quote a few years ago, we did some burning trials to see what happened with the African love grass plants um, post burning. And what we found was that particularly in the drier years, um, burning the plants, yes, certainly reduced all that dead herbage mass that we see, um, but the plants rapidly recovered afterwards. And yes, they looked quite green. Um, but what we did find was that those plants shifted from vegetative mode to reproductive mode a lot more quickly. Um, maybe it was the lack of mulch around the plants, maybe it was the extra stress from burning, but these plants shifted from vaguely useful vegetative phase through to fairly unuseful reproductive phase quite quickly compared to the unburnt plants. So um, we didn't see a huge value um, from a, a farming perspective in, in that process being pursued long term. Yeah, actually, I had uh, I read a, a recent paper and um, African lac grass was put under 100 degrees for nine minutes and still some seeds germinate. So actually, it's quite uh, tolerant to, um, to the fire. And also, as Joe said, uh, after the fire burning, it regrows nicely, of course. And we still have to come back with um, other options like herbicide or poach emerging herbicide. Yeah. Or, or even keep, continue the grazing, multiple grazing over time. Yeah, it's a very tool. It's a, it's a, it can be a useful tool, but it needs to be managed very, very carefully if it is to be adopted. Especially to the fire risk. Absolutely. Um, a question here, sort of building on from that grazing point. Um, do you have any information on the digestibility of African lovegrass or lovegrasses in general? Um, and where could you find that information? Um, actually, I was going to present, I, 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 because of time constraint, I didn't present. I think uh, from memory, um, Loop did a nice uh, fact sheet of Eklund grass, I think a few years back. And uh, in, that, in that document, as you imagine, um, Eklund grass starting from spring, to the, to the summer and senescence. So from early growth, I think they were talking about about 50 to 90% or to 50 to 60% of digestibility. And then uh, decrease to about 38% when it's mature. And then crude protein starting from 18% down to about 4%. So, and the, the photo I show in the green softer looking um, grasses, Oh, sorry, the treatment of the African lac grass. And we did a fee value test of that. I think it was a similar value. I think it was about 50, 57 of uh, digestibility. And uh, it's about 9% of protein. And it's, it's a typical tropical grass. Um, it just, it's structured differently than our temperate grasses. Um, yeah, certainly if you want to graze it uh, to have some to utilize the fee values, the young growing state would be the best to go. And a stock probably won't touch mature even, but, uh, and you're going to lose weight. Yeah, and that's our biggest problem. We've got short windows of time when the plant's actually vegetative um, and large periods of time here on the Monero when the plant's not particularly in a, in a valuable form for us for grazing. Okay. Um, questions are still coming through, but for time's sake, we might uh, finish up with this last, one last question um, so that everyone can yep. get on with their day. Um, which non-native perennial grazing grasses offer the best competition to annual, oh sorry, African lovegrass? I think, um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so the, the mixtures of um, um, loosen and chicory uh, really encourage us to do a bit more screening work. So in the coming trials, we have, uh, we come up with uh, many more uh, different uh, perennial grass species like Phalaris and the new ones we have uh, mountain rice and even Kernza. 
because these are from previous trials are showing um, showing promising uh, summer growth patterns. So hopefully uh, mixing with uh, clovers could provide uh, long-term suppression from winter all the way through to summer. We had to wait and see. Yeah, I mean, look at our typical temperate grasses that we saw down here, are, um, you know, our, our coxfoots and our phalaris um, moving through into sort of our fescues. And it all depends on what soil type you're on as well. Um, unfortunately, love grass loves that country that is a little bit harder to get these plants established on. Um, but you're looking for a plant that's going to be quite aggressive in its growth um, and compete actively with African love grass. So it is challenging. And, and maybe you need to look at some of those other um, tropical or C4 grasses to help fill in that space as well. Thank you. And thank you to our presenters um, and to the audience for asking some great questions as well. Um, we might wrap up here. Um, so as I've mentioned, this webinar has been recorded and we will send out a link to the recording hopefully in the next week or so. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you.